and welcome to the Cinemondo <laughs> Podcast with Kathy, Mark, and Burke talking about movies. Horror, sci-fi, unusual, unknown, forgotten, <laughs> underappreciated, always interesting, sometimes documentary, and other things. <laughs> and we have a special guest today, as you can see. Yes. Uh, we're very happy to have Elise Ardell Spiegel with us. Hi. To chat about her career as an editor. She's done wonderful work. Uh, this is Congo, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, the HBO series about the Golden Gate Killer uh, with uh, Michelle uh, McNamara. and Golden um, State. <laughs> What did I say? Golden, Golden Gate? Gate? Oh, gosh. I'm sorry. He only killed in San Francisco. As a different killer. Golden State. Um, and uh, Paradise Lost 3, Purgatory. So, Elise, thanks very much for spending it's my some time pleasure. with us Thanks today. for having me. It's so exciting to see everyone. It yeah, is. Yeah, it's good to see you. It's been a long time. Nice. Yeah, we met you on Paradise Lost Three, and when you yeah, why don't you tell that, that film? Why don't you tell that story a little bit? How you two met? How you three met? <laughs> We met at HBO, the HBO premiere in New York, right? Is that our first? Right. I, think I think that would be correct. Yeah. And what an event that was, right? Yeah. Because the boys had just gotten out of prison and it was surreal. I mean, was... you guys were in West Memphis when all of it was going down. And so we're really part of the whole thing. But um, wow, what a weird, crazy time that was. Yeah. yeah. Was we absolutely... thought it would never come. Yeah. <laughs> really surreal is the word for it because we we felt like you know when we never really want we've said this before but we've never we never really wanted to be in a true crime documentary you know <laughs> and <laughs> i remember joe and bruce were talking to us and saying you know you guys should do this because we really want your voice to be in the story and and we were like i don't know if i want it to be about us you know but then we thought about it and we were like i guess we sort of have a responsibility to to tell you know to tell our that other side of it instead of everybody just going you go to uh -oh. hell and all that kind of stuff <laughs> so we did it and yeah. it was a uh, it was scary for us and when you're in a documentary you, you you sort of step into the story and so when they did when they got out and we did meet everyone all you guys who made the the film the films we felt like we had stepped into the story in a in a weird way yeah, that must have been weird for you guys to to be in that. For me, always as an editor, I deal in footage of people all the time, and then when I meet them, I, I feel like I know them very well. Right. I spent hours and Too hours, well. That's true. and I walk up to them like I know. I mean, I learned eventually to stop doing that. It freaks people out. You know? But and that's uh, what you did at the party. You walk up, hi, I'm Elise. Yeah. I did it. My what? <laughs> Who is this woman? It's my old friend. <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, totally. Um, but you guys were an integral part of that story. And it, it would be foolish as filmmakers to not include that aspect of it after the years of work that you put into that case and how proactive you were in, in, in creating the eventual outcome, you know, part of that process. So I think I think it was essential that you guys were in the film, obviously. <laughs> well, thanks yeah. for saying that but i think yeah. there were so many people the film the films were integral you know that was a to me it was you know when you think about how what led up to the release of these three guys from prison which if anybody's if anybody's watching this and doesn't know the story it's a it's a long story <laughs> it gets longer but it's about it too. <laughs> it's a documentary series of three films about a, a a murder case in West Memphis, Arkansas, where, you know, the three people were falsely accused and imprisoned. And, and, uh, at first everybody thought they were guilty. And in the films, you see everybody throwing rocks at them at the, and wishing that they have all kinds of horrible things happen to them in prison. And as the films progress, we go to part two and you see people that that support them and the reactions of people who don't support them towards the people who do. And then in the third film that it, it was a total sea change, you know, it was a change of minds that you see happening in these, in these films. And by the third one, it seems like That's everybody right. realizes that they're innocent and then they get out at the end, you know, spoiler, uh, but <laughs> well, your task at least is that you had to take basically three, two films condense them into the, th the third film and also add the new 
outcomes that kind of started happening while yeah. you were there editing was, it. So what was so that challenge? I, well, it was really um, daunting, but very exciting also to think about how to, you know, the original Paradise Lost had such a tremendous sort of fan base, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. um, lots from lots of the work that you guys did actually, right? But uh, I think, um, so for me, it, the challenge and the responsibility was to actually ensure that I was telling those other, uh, showing a new light on, on what the fans already understood about the case, mm. footage that had never been seen before. And Bruce and I worked together a lot um, going through the 16 millimeter um, film to, mm. or he, he went through it and I, and would give me the selects and stuff and, and we'd discuss oh. and, collaborate on what to grab that was new and interesting and do you have this and what it you know for for him to also re-go through that material from the first film was an mm. interesting sort of plunge back into that reality in that time so it was a really interesting process but it yeah it was exciting to sort of think of a new way to tell the story for people who were so familiar with it and then That's excite true. them with new material that they had mm. never seen before yeah. And I was the, you know, I, when I saw Paradise Lost, um, that's what made me want to get into documentary films. I, I was really? blown away by that film. And, oh, wow. and I was struck by how, um, you know, reality is way more far out than anything you could script or write. And I, I just was fascinated by um, that case and what happened and those characters that were so rich, you couldn't write them. It right. was un unreal you know yeah. and uh so for me it was a tremendous honor um to work on that film and and then to figure out a new way to sort of retell a well-known story yeah, well that I, had to be hard i think it's interesting that that film said okay told you like i want to do i want to edit documentaries mostly so you've basically done that since then yeah i mean yeah. i i the, my first, it's interesting. I uh, came into documentary in a roundabout way. I, when I saw that film, I knew I was obsessed with documentaries and I thought how fascinating they are. I didn't set out to be like a doc filmmaker at that point. I, uh, I was working in South Africa on a cultural exchange where I was facilitating uh, like international artists. And mm -hmm. um, I met um, this, young man named King Molapo who was shooting uh, our events and he had a natural ability as a shooter and had wanted to make a film about architecture in Johannesburg and how it was part of the systemic oppression, um, mm, you know, oh. in, in the architecture that you could see on full view and, yeah. and part of apartheid essentially. And, and I thought that was a fascinating idea and I was struck by his talent as a shooter and wanted to help him. And I um, learned how to cut on that project and we worked on it for years and it was a pretty terrible film. But <laughs> what I discovered was that, you know, um, I really loved spending the time on figuring out the challenges of editing and the story and getting the rhythm right. And it was something that I started doing that I wanted to learn more you know in life you find lots of things that you're interested in and you want to learn you know you go down a path and then you lose interest but i never kind of lost interest in the challenges of editing and i i i realized hey this is something i'm i'm into and i like can you guys hear the motorcycles outside by the yeah. is that a motorcycle <laughs> it's like a huge in brooklyn today there's in my neighborhood it's like a huge i almost feel like it's a dmx tribute there's like, oh, it's, really? there's, it, the, they they shut down atlantic and they're doing wheelies and all kinds of that's, crazy hilarious. Things. that's really yeah. funny sorry if you hear the most no it's just no, 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 no. It's, not, it's not disruptive at all it's, <laughs> great, anyway, it's um, great, a great ambience to uh you know the brooklyn cool. vibe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um but yeah so that um it was a terrible film, but I was passionate about it. And then I found through friends, you know, how do I get into this? And I, um, I was really lucky that I lived across the hall too from Michael Bonfiglio. We were <laughs> neighbors and, uh, I had started working. I found that if I wanted to be an editor, that I should become an assistant editor. And I 
got into that through a different friend and uh, Hart Perry, who was part of the um, company Perry Films that I was working at. We did the history of hip hop and I was a assistant on that. And um, he asked me to cut a sizzle reel for Jesse Jackson, something, a film he wanted to work on about Jesse Jackson. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I cut together this sizzle from the footage he gave me. And I showed it to my good friend across the hall, Mike, to be like, <laughs> nobody has given me any notes. Like, I don't know if this is good or bad. Like, what do you think? Horrifying. Can you just tell me, just tell me what I need to do to improve. <laughs> and he, he watched it and he was like, yeah, you can cut, Elise. And then he sort of, he knew I spoke fluent Spanish and him and Joe were um, embarking on a film, which was crude. Crude, at the yeah. time. And um, that was my first feature. And wow. Mike got me that job and, and wow. sort of, yeah, it was, I came cheap and I spoke the language and, and <laughs> it, I really hit it off with Joe. And, uh, and he told me that if they got money for the film, um, that he would want me to edit it and, the rest is history. Wow, that's a huge leap. That's, that's great. Cool. Yeah, and that's amazing. Very lucky. That'd be scary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? Well, well, you know, when you know. I, I so what happened actually was they were trying to raise money for crude, and so they hired me to cut the sizzle for the film. Mm. And when I cut that, Joe liked my work, which was great. And he said, if I get the money for this, I want you to edit the film. And that took a year to get the money for that. But Joe gave me a job as an editor at Radical Media on a series that him and Bruce were doing um, uh, called Bold Moves about Ford Motor Company um, yes. series. And uh, I really got a lot of experience by working on that as an editor. And just, you know, we had to create these short pieces that often sat in meetings. So it was very tedious material to go through. But um, it was great practice. And and then I, you know, the, yeah, then I, we got money for the film and I cut it. Which See, really that's cool. a tribute to your talent though. And that he recognized the passion and the talent because you got right in with like one of the top documentary filmmakers, like almost right off the bat. And that's not nothing. Well, e editing is something that people don't realize the importance of, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that if people who work in film do because if you work in film, you see how the film is shot and how it's made. And you and so many times I've worked on things where it's like, this is not going to be good. But then that not so great stuff that you have worries about goes to a good editor. And it <laughs> and so many the, the person on the crew who saves the most films is the editor. I think they they can save a film. And you always hear that. You always hear even you know things like Star Wars and whatever. People were like, "That movie's never gonna. It's awful. The, we saw a rough cut, and it's terrible." But then an editor comes in mm -hmm. with that magic, and they turn it into something that succeeds. Editing is an unsung hero of of the film film crew as the editor. <laughs> Well, we as editors love hearing people talk about it that way. <laughs> yeah, true, we're, but it is rarely talked about that way. But and and I know also um, now from many years of experience that it's truly a, a masterful collaboration, all of it. And you can't have right. one piece without the other. Right. And yeah. and it, it is truly about the collaboration of, of different forces of people and, and a lot of trust. Yeah. And um, a sort of creating an environment, a working environment where you feel um, like you can bring your creative best self and other people are open to that. Um, yeah. But 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 thank you for saying that about editors <laughs> on behalf of all the editors in the world. <laughs> thank you. But it's so true. You know, I've known some directors who really want to have the editor on set, you know, even like, yeah. you know, because a lot of times editors come in later and they just get handed all this footage and they have to figure out what, to, you know, but if you have an editor, a good collaboration between a director and editor, having the editor on set is a, is a really handy thing sometimes because they can say, you know what, could you get one more shot from over here? You know, because you'll know I'm what you're thinking need. ahead of where yeah. I want to put that. And, and, and problem solving already, they can see the sort of problems that could occur yeah. in when they're watching this unfold, the shooting that's happening yeah. and, and, 
figuring out quick solutions on site. Right. It's a very good idea. I think. Saving time. Yeah. You know, we don't need a master of this one. This doesn't need a master. Just get that one shot there and I'm done. I got all I need. <laughs> yeah, I was actually lucky on uh, This Is Congo to be producing, which is mm -hmm. essentially being an editor in the field also right. uh, with Dan um, to help shape the film in that way. And that was very, I think, beneficial for that really complex narrative. Um, yeah, tell us about that because that's that's an amazing, like, just a film because it looked really dangerous to shoot and you're on the other side of the world and it's just, I mean, that's like whole other level from like, you know, some of the, the, yeah, the things was, like. It's like very different from interesting. sitting in an editing and you're a producer. in Burbank, you know. Yeah. You're, you're, <laughs> <laughs> so how did you come about doing that? So um, Daniel McCabe got in touch with me via, I think, a mutual friend, um, sort of sent him my work and sent him my way. And he had gone. He, he was a photojournalist, photographer, tur wanting to turn documentary filmmaker. He was, became obsessed with the Congo. Maybe obsession isn't the right word. He became very <laughs> intrigued by the Congo and, and and after spending some time there and really wanted to dig in and learn more and was struck by the beauty of the place and how confusing it was in terms of what was going on politically. And um, and he went out there and shot a bunch of footage. It was his first film and him and the producing team sort of came to me with, I think they had 120 hours from their first trip mm -hmm. and said like, we want to make this film. And Dan had cut this really beautiful, amazing, mesmerizing seven minute sizzle <laughs> of, uh, but it was gorgeous, but it, and it was cool looking, but I had no idea what this story was about, but I knew I wanted to be involved. Right. And um, so then we sort of worked together from that point. Uh, you know, I went through the existing footage, got it translated, new sort of, identified potential characters, people to go back to and follow through with. Um, together, we sorted that out. Um, and then uh, after years of, you know, budgets coming and going and working on other things, um, I eventually went into the field with Dan after the war had ended to mm -hmm. sort of get final story beats and to right. interview um, Colonel Kasongo, who's the character that I use to sort of weave the narrative together, um, because it's, you know, the Congo's history and understanding it um, from any perspective, but particularly from a Western perspective, is very was very complex. And so it was interesting that going there actually you know because i had been reading books and you study and mm -hmm. you try and figure it out but it wasn't until i went there <laughs> that i got the place in a way more so in order to, where i felt i had better tools to right. help share the story with others mm -hmm. um which is it was a weird um experience to have it happen that way because part of editing is always being you know, the, the beauty of the relationship and collaboration between editors and directors is that the editor is, is in a room looking at the footage they got. You know, a lot right. of times directors, especially particularly in docs, you know, go out and shoot material and think because they were there and they had an emotion or feeling and they thought something was great, but it just doesn't translate necessarily, you know, for the edit uh, in film. Mm -hmm. And so it's your job to look, you know, with a, fresh eyes at the, mm -hmm. at the material and, and think of new ways and how, how you can use it um, or not, or leave it right. you know, often. Um, but so that was a really interesting experience for me to see how going there on this particular film really aided me in telling that story. And, and I became equally um, taken by Congo. It is, one of the most amazing places you guys have spent time in Rwanda, right? Um, right. Yeah, we went to Rwanda, Chad and I did. Yeah. And it was funny because the, the people in Rwanda, cause we went gorilla trekking. And so we right. go into the Virunga volcanoes, right. half of it's Congo and half of it's Rwanda. Yeah. So there's like a very strict red line. They don't want you going to Congo. They make it sound really scary. They're like, do not oh, yeah. cross over or you're just on your own. Like people are getting killed 
you know, crossing over the line. There's people, you know, and when you mm. go on these treks, there's all kinds of like military. You don't see this in the beautiful nature pictures, but they have guys with guns sort of with you just oh, in yeah. case. They tell you, though, it's mostly for Cape Buffalo because technically they kill more people than people do in Rwanda. But Rebels. Congo is always painted to us as a very horrifying place to go. And, you know, it was always we thought just going to Rwanda was kind of insane enough to seeing gorillas. So it was almost too overwhelming to imagine going to the Congo, but it's still on my list of like places to go. Yeah, I, I absolutely recommend it. It's an amazing, Africa is amazing in general. It's I've been to a few places there. I just absolutely, it changes you. I feel like yeah. you have to be there in this incredible place for some reason, once in your life, just to just feel it. It's just an incredible yeah, it place. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, and of course, Rwanda in Congo couldn't be more different, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because they share yeah. um, tribes and culture, mm -hmm. and yet it's the history is dictated a very different reality in both mm -hmm. places. But um, mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah, of course they yeah. Yes. <laughs> you need to be prepared to go to the Congo. That's all. <laughs> just don't just yeah. go in there. <laughs> I, we, we worked with an amazing fixer, Reb Bulambo Shindano, who's, uh, he, without Reb, that film would not have been at all possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he is, knows over 11 tribal languages. He is wow. the kind wow. of, jack of all trades that you want with you in any situation mm. We're, like he knows how to talk with people and how to deal with people whether sometimes in surprising ways where you're like what why are you shouting at that rebel or up but uh, he he he's he's masterful in in his abilities of communication and um was an incredible collaborator and i feel so lucky that um the relationships i've made in in my career because of um, these films and the people I've met, it, it has been truly extraordinary. That's amazing. That's ha, have you, uh, on other films, have you gone to on set like you did go somewhere else or has mostly been sort of, you know, in, in the editing room? Uh, well, I've been doing more producing these days. Mm -hmm. um, cool. on, I'm working with Dan again on a film right now, a short film um, about Nsenene, which is grasshoppers in Uganda. Huh. So oh, wow. I Back was Africa. Just, yeah, <laughs> I was just um, there with him again uh, for that during COVID. Actually, uh, at the it, we went from October through December this wow. last year, and basically twice a year there's this seasonal thing that grasshoppers swarm, and there's men who trap them, and they put up these huge um, light, UV lights to attract them and uh, with huge loud generators and it's a delicacy as, a, but it's also an alternate food source, um, which is incredibly high in protein and, deli and delicious by the way, like a meat <laughs> treat um, that's sweet and like, like, I guess I would liken it to like popcorn or peanuts in that oh, snacky kind of a way that's you're just like yeah give me more of that. <laughs> <laughs> they're addicting um, that's very funny addicting. And, uh, countries and, and, where insects are, are eaten and it, it's <laughs> interesting at first but then you're like hmm you know <laughs> well my favorite is like when the little leg hairs when you're like oh, <laughs> this is yummy wait <laughs> this is so good <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it, oh yeah, I'm eating a bug. Oh, hold on. That, that's uh, sort of, we, we set out to sort of, uh, we have a friend, Michele, who we met in Congo, um, who was working on a book. He lived in Uganda for several years with his family, and he was working on a book. He's an Italian photographer about this trapping season because they the lights are green and huge and light up dark skies, and it's it's truly an amazing thing to witness when they mm. come. The so swarm. what what is the environmental impact of something like that? Like is this swarming bad for the environment or is them trapping it bad for the environment? Like which yeah. is it? Yeah, I, it's it's sort of a, a big question, I think. Mm. Um it's certainly not good the trapping in the ways that they're doing it. People mm. are burned with the UV lights, they remove oh, the yeah. protective filter of the UV lights because <sighs> they believe it attracts it them more and it does and uh 
<laughs> we're looking for actively sustainable ways to um, mm -hmm. to you know capture them and to you Be know people. breed them. I guess the breed right, is wow. not the right word, but uh, yeah. So they um, we were actually really lucky this time. Um, we met a scientist named Francis Sangendo, who we worked with, who was able to capture, show us where the eggs were and yeah. capture them and incubate them. And so we were able to capture their birth, which oh, that's crazy. Wow. I don't think has ever been captured before. So that that's was really super cool. exciting. And yeah. um, the material is really fun. And we're, we're, we're trying to sort of, after COVID and after working on um, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, which was quite heavy, a lot of the films I do are heavy films. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think we wanted to, in this pandemic time, we set out to make a sort of experiential escapist film right. Right. where you're sort of taken into a different world. Um, right. And we're trying to look at the balance between, you know, man and nature and mm -hmm. how they interact and in this particular situation. And um, that's that's sort of the hope for the film is to be is, this is, sort of experiential wild ride. It, it and, sounds perfect for people who are stuck in their homes to see something <laughs> that they normally wouldn't see. Is that something that's coming out soon? Or, 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 is it going to festivals? Well, so I'm, I'm editing that now. I'm, I'm hoping to do it quickly, uh, but you know, these things, always take longer than you. but um yeah i i i will will definitely put it into festivals i'll definitely let you guys know about it when it's finished and yeah definitely i'll send you a little teaser after. <laughs> a sizzle reel i see a sizzle reel and do you have do you have a title for it in senene in senene okay right. is that is that uh, a word that they use for in africa for something that's grasshoppers grasshopper in Ugandan. Oh, like, cool. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. You could have guessed that, Kathy, right? I was going to ask before I made an ass on myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we're all ask instead of just guessing. It's so interesting that, that, that idea of the, that you're talking about the idea of the sort of experiential kind of, if that's the word, film. Yeah. Um, you know, during COVID, um, my wife and I have been watching so much travel videos on YouTube. Mm. And we, there's there's this sub weird little subsets and tangents of films that are that are almost like ambient music. You know, there there's very little in them, but there's a lot in them. You know, it's like we watched one last night that I just loved. It was somebody who got on a train and went to a small village in the Ukraine, oh, cool. evidently to just visit family there. And they sit down and they watch you know, you, there's no talking, there's no, you know, there's no narrative or anything. It's just footage and it's beautifully shot with a nice camera <laughs> and you get the sound and they hold on the shots. Yeah. Like they're like mm -hmm. looking down a street where there's a lady walking past with her groceries and you hold on that shot yeah. and then you go yeah, to another place. And, yeah. yeah. Let's and you get, that's what yeah. I love about travel is getting the feel of, of the place and the sounds you hear the, you hear the sounds of the, the insects and the birds and they show the plants and they show a tree and there's a peach growing on the tree. And then you see the woman cooking and you see the, the little kids helping with the cooking and, and then you see them washing the dishes and you see them going out and sitting outside and listening to the, you know, the cicadas or whatever. And then, and at the end they get back on the train and they go, and it ends. And that, <laughs> to me, I love that kind of thing. It's something you'd never see on regular television, but. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, with how content is going these days and how we're bombarded with information at every yeah. turn, it sounds really refreshing to be able to have that regular experience in cinema. Yeah. Right? Where, yeah. where it's, our, everything else is moving so fast all around mm -hmm. us that, it, I'm I'm excited if it's returning to that sort of, uh, or that th those those films are available for people if they want yeah. to see them. It's almost like we're discovering that people a, want that, you know, that yeah. because you look at it's like it's got three million views. Good lord, you know, <laughs> this really pensive, yeah. meditative visit to a village in the Ukraine, and and it's, it, I it's love that. Movie. I love it. it's like very specific, but I could watch those all day. Yeah. <laughs> 
Now, the opposite of that would be Gone in the Dark. <laughs> right. Is, now, I want to hear about that film because... Um, up for me, guys. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh. You there now? You good? Can you hear yeah. us? I Are can hear you. It okay. just like paused. Paused. Okay. I didn't hear the what Bert said. That is something we're going to edit. <laughs> <laughs> Can you? But you can hear us now. I can hear you. Okay, <laughs> I can hear you already. <laughs> okay, take two. So I wanted to talk about Gone in the Dark because that had to be kind of a weird experience too, because that had so much history. Let alone the length of time that this crime was going on. These crimes were going on. I wanted to play the trailer just for people. I know you didn't cut the trailer. I'm assuming this no, is something trailer no. companies do. No, no. <laughs> but I thought I'd play it real quick and people can get familiar with it. We were awakened by a voice and a bright light. It was a real sense of evil in the house. He made me tie up my husband. He ordered her to put dishes on my back and say, if I hear these dishes fall down, I'm going to kill your family. Pat Oswalt sitting here with Michelle McNamara, my wife, who's the writer of one of the best written crime blogs. Michelle looked at it from the hopeful, putting puzzles together, trying to make sense of violence. I was in search of a man who was attacking women and girls throughout Northern California. And the great tragedy of this case to me is that it's not better known. Irvine Police Department investigating an apparent homicide. He's called the Golden State Killer. This case is huge. Michelle would actually go to the crime scene and walk the case. Geographic connections, DNA profiles, genealogy websites. The first time she called me, I thought, hmm, she knows her stuff. So I started telling her things about my investigation. When these crimes began in the 70s, women didn't talk about sexual assault because they were often blamed. Somehow, it always came back to being the woman's fault. The story of the victims, it has to be told. He had cased the place. He knew to lift the glass out of the back window. I understood what it meant to have your skin crawl. And I'm thinking, is this really happening? I don't know how Michelle lived the horror of that day after day. She was writing a book, and she was trying to solve a case. After Michelle died, we had to finish her book. I'll be gone in the dark. You threatened a victim once. One day soon, you'll hear footsteps coming up your front walk. The doorbell rings. Take one of your hyper-gulping breaths. This is how it ends for you. He's been called the original Night Stalker and the Golden State Killer. Today, it's our pleasure to call him Defendant. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that what? goes so like far back. The, you know, Patton Oswalt was a uh, big supporter of West Memphis 3. He did a lot of benefits. So it felt like there was a definite, like, sort of organic connection to this film because his wife was Yeah, I believe I crowd. found out in my research. Oh, okay. right. I think I found out in my research that they uh that they were um they watched Paradise Lost, I know, and, and stuff. So uh Isn't that funny. <laughs> yeah, it was it's surreal also. Um but uh yeah, that was a really um fascinating and interesting project. Um not only because you're dealing with this case where there was so many survivors of these women who had been raped and the horror that they went through. Um, but that we were telling Michelle's story, this woman who had also, who had died in the process of her researching it and, um, and obsession with the case. And so that was very interesting and complex um, to sort of bring her so to speak, you know, um, to life um, through her writing um, and voicemails and all kinds of things. Um, yeah. Uh, so that that was that posed a, a a huge responsibility for the filmmakers and um, and was an extraordinary challenge, but a really creatively a very interesting one for mm. myself and my fellow editors on that um, series. And that was that your first series? Because you've done that was my first series, actually. 
that had but, to be kind of daunting because that'd be that's that's a lot of footage. <laughs> Yeah. It was, but, you know, we had a team. There were three of us to do the right. six episodes, and uh, we took on episodes and mm. collaborated. And it was it was actually, uh, I felt really comfortable in the series space. Um, I really enjoyed that process and thinking about the larger arc of the story and spreading it out and how mm. to create, you know, we all did cliffhangers and, and, and what was exciting and, um, and I found it to be a genre that I, I was really lit up by in a creative way that I, I hope to do more like that. Wow. Also, the films that I've done, the narrative structure and arc is often quite complex because of the amount of information and storytelling. Right. So it felt a little bit freeing to think about how to spend a little more time in things and, and, and mm -hmm. how to draw them out a little bit more. And, and how, like I said, where to drop certain information or drop breadcrumbs for an audience in a series way, in a bingeable way. You know, I, I found it super exciting actually. And, and, and not as daunting as, um, and also that's the first thing I've done with a team of um, editors, which mostly, you know, it's just me in a room and uh, working with the director at times and otherwise a lot of time alone. So it felt really exciting to collaborate on a team like that. Did each of the three of you all uh, work on all the episodes or did each editor take like two episodes? How did that work? We took each editor originally took two episodes. Mm -hmm. I think there was a timing thing and I ended up cutting the first three episodes of that. Um, I worked with Jawad. He had worked a lot on episode one and, and then I worked on it. Um, and so I did the first three and that was intense back to back cutting yeah. those first three episodes. Um, but um, but a tremendous experience and uh, and really interesting and 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 challenging. You know, the the challenging part about that was just the level of violence and yeah, hearing these yeah. women's stories. Episode right. two was sort of where we went into the survivor stories and um, spending a lot of time in in that world. Yeah. You know, is challenging. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but really felt really um, important that they were able to tell their stories mm -hmm. and and um, in their own words and were sort of able to, um, you know, for the first time, many of them were telling their stories in this very public way. So it was a really mm -hmm. interesting experience. Well, it does have to be sure. sort of overwhelming after a while. Like you were saying, being in that space, you know, we, you know, we've, we've kind of all were there together with the West Memphis three thing and the paradise lost films where you get, right. you spend so much time in that place and you, you really, you get kind of overwhelmed by, it. I remember sometimes being just really depressed and, and kind of suddenly realizing why it's like, because yeah. I've spent so much time thinking about a horrible, horrible thing, you know, that happened and, and getting yeah. close to people that have, in, been involved in these things. I imagine that's, that gets to you after a while, you have to sort of step back from it. And yeah. I mean, I think it's probably why, why I went to Uganda to work on grasshoppers right now. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. That's yeah. true. Exactly. <laughs> that's like and of course, murder. you know, once you do a series on murder or a film on murder or true crime or mm -hmm. uh, any sort of, when I did crude, of course, everyone called me then only about environmental films and, yeah. um, it, but so, um, you know, you definitely, uh, it w what's been exciting for me in my career is to be able to choose the projects that I work on and, uh, and, and sort of find things creatively that are exciting to me. It doesn't matter what genre or, or what, what particular story, it's sort of um, what I think will be creatively challenging and, and sort of feed me my soul a little bit. And, um, right. and that, changes and yes it's you can't spend too much time in any of those uh worlds but um right. I've, I've learned that because as an editor especially in doc you like dive into these truly dive in deep um to these stories um but then there's something else right behind it in a different right. intense way yeah. um and i don't i don't know how how i've processed all that or dealt with all of that, you know, um, but 
but I, I guess I find the excitement in, in sort of figuring out ways of sharing these stories yeah. mm -hmm. with others and, and um, how to make it a, a journey for them as a viewer. So what is your process? Like when you're, when you get, we'll just use like this, you know, the series is the jumping off point, but when you get all this film and you have to go through and find the selects or the, the sections you want to use, I'm probably not using any of the proper lingo, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but uh, when you have to find, how do you find, like what sticks out to you as something, yeah, I'm going to use that. Like, how do you, what's your actual process in that pulling that footage? You know, it's, the, well, first of all, in a series like I'll Be Gone in the Dark, we had a tremendous team of um, associate producers working with us and um, three directors under Liz Garbus. Um, mm -hmm. And and they and it was we were shooting while we were editing. And, and mm -hmm. it was a true, wonderful sort of collaboration because, you you know, you would find in the police tapes this woman who Michelle interviewed and say, wow, she's who's this Kim Stewart? Let's get her, you know, like she sounds amazing. Right. She's got pep and like, I want to hear more from her. And she was in Santa Barbara. Ugh. And mm -hmm. so these are the types of uh, uh, ways that we would work, you know, in this very collaborative way. But um, I think as an editor, you know, it's going to sound really weird probably to talk about it in this way, but um, there's something that strikes you in the material, something within the humanity of, of, of the thing, whatever it is mm -hmm. that you're working on. And I think, I think it's an instinct thing an idea is sparked or you see how, you know, it, it's always daunting when you begin a project because it's quite overwhelming and you think, Oh my God, I have to make something out of this. Documentaries <laughs> have so much footage. The ratio of what's shot yeah. and what ends up in the film is huge. Most films like normal, you know, not normal, but, you know, narrative fictional films, they shoot what they need and a little bit I more, mean, you know, <laughs> but with documentaries, sometimes they'll shoot whole days and days and days of material that you end up not needing. And also it's not in a chronological type thing. You might shoot. I mean, neither is, is uh, fictional films, but with documentaries, even after you shoot it, you may put this before that or this after that, or this, you may mix things in, in a way that you don't with the regular narrative fictional film. So I, there's added, there's, there's added levels of storytelling where you have to tell the story with documentary. And what you're saying is like having to keep this all in your mind and, and to make it make sense to make something that goes off on a million tangents to mm -hmm. keep it like I remember with the West Memphis three stuff, there were so many tangents and so many places sure, you could yeah, go off yeah. and, and lose the, the, the thread. And I imagine that's, I, I can't even imagine editing <laughs> a, a documentary well, to be it's honest. A, it's a process. <laughs> you know, we, we talk about it and, and, and it's a, it's a process and mm. it's, it, it can be very daunting at first, but then you sort of bite it off in manageable chunks, you know, right. like here's a scene that seems compelling. Let me cut that. Here's, you know, I'll, I'll sort of deal with things in that way or pull from interview selects that are interesting. And then, you know, through the process, things start to emerge, new ideas start to be bridged together and you sort of find your way. I always feel like my job as an editor is to be a good listener, actually, like it within the material. And I feel mm. like films in a body of work in documentary want to come out to tell a story and it's my job to bring those components out to tell the story that right. was within the material that it wants to tell not necessarily only what a director is trying to achieve right. um mm -hmm. but what what is the material trying to do and um i think it requires a great deal of listening and um and and certainly it's you know it's your perspective it's it's my um interpretation and through my experiences of how I think I want to retell this thing. And, and other times it's trying to achieve, you know, um, someone else's vision to tell that. And then you, you try and um, be a good listener for your director or producers to figure out how do I, you know, what, how do we create this idea with this material? And it's, it's an exciting um, process, truly. It, it's a, it's a journey. And I think anyone who's made a film, 
especially in documentary, will tell you that it's an incredibly challenging journey. And right. it's kind of like giving birth, uh, apparently. <laughs> that was, apparently. Once, once, it's, once you finish and you have this product of the film, it, it takes on a life of its own. And it's no right. longer your thing that you right. hold on to and the decisions that were made and it just sort of <laughs> has its own life. And, right. and it's really fascinating to watch and to right. see people's response and how things that you intended are working and things you didn't intend work for different minds in a different way. It's, it's truly a, um, a riveting process. Yeah. yeah. I, I love say. that. It's, it makes you want to do editing. That, <laughs> sometimes that baby doesn't grow up to be the person you expected them to be. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> <better>. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You never that's know. True. Would you ever want to do uh, like do scripted narrative, like fictional stuff or, um, you something? know, it's interesting. My, uh, so my husband, um, Jonah Moran, is also an editor. He started out in doc and he um, has since moved into doing narrative series. He did Fosse Vernon mm -hmm. and he actually cut Hamilton. Um, nice. The uh, film play, which is exciting, which Very is not cool. a narrative construct. But anyway, he, he's done a lot of work and it's a totally different style of working. Very editors on narrative stuff are very important unsung heroes as well in terms of like for me it's uh the process of like finding a the right take to match up with a performance and the, it can affect and change the direction you go in in a scene right. you know and uh i find that to be like whoa and like not as interesting but my husband for example he loves that and he hates i shouldn't say he hates he <laughs> he, he really appreciates that and loves that aspect and doesn't enjoy the writing aspect of documentary of creating uh, you know mm -hmm. looking at the puzzle and then making something of it you know right, um, right. And, and i think we're the opposite in that way i really love that aspect of documentary but um and i found myself actually i'm i'm i've created a company with some friends of mine and we're starting to write um, scripted yeah. series, of different things. Oh, nice. um, and so I've been doing some writing and I've, I've really been enjoying that a lot, um, more than I could have imagined. Um, and yeah. Wow. So who knows? So, do you write with editing in mind? <laughs> I do. I think that my editing has helped, has, has informed oh. how I visualize uh, sure. things oh, that's completely cool. and, and how I see things in my mind. And I, it's exciting because instead of working from what is there, the world is your oyster. Anything yeah. can happen, That's right? True. So yeah. you're, there, it's freeing in a way and daunting because of it, but it's like mm -hmm. super, um, it's exciting to see my clear vision of a thing and then be able to put it down on paper. Right. Um, That's really cool. It is exciting. It's, it's a new thing for me and I, I'm excited that I'm sort of stretching out in different areas of my um, creative mind, you know? Um, That's great. Yeah. So you have cool. some upcoming projects you can talk about that you're excited about? I don't know if I can talk about them. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot of exciting things. We're writing different uh, comedy series about a motel in Virginia, um, a, a script called Holy Turban about a Sikh kid who, uh, enters a Bible trivia contest, <laughs> um, which is based on my friend Vinny's real life. And, uh, that's great. Um, and a series um, that sort of looks at uh, um, in, the returned enslaved people uh, returning to the South to be mm -hmm. spies and help bring down the Confederacy, which is completely based in reality, a history that's that we don't know about. And I'm really yeah. excited about that. Wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's um, it's fascinating and um, and mm -hmm. and an important history, and it taps into my doc reality research uh, yeah. mind, and then yeah. and then um, pulling from that, which is exciting too. So, so you're still sort of doing documentaries, but now you're writing. Well, I mean, I, I I I'm definitely doing. I'm I'm working on a doc as we speak with the Ugandan film. Right. There's a series that um, I'm excited about potentially um, in the future. And um, Very cool. so, yeah, there's 
I think I think I, I wonder what else I'll do. I, I have visions of doing community theater one day and you know lots of kinds of stuff. <laughs> do, do you really, really want to direct? Uh, um, <laughs> I you know, directing is um is is also it seem I would love to have the opportunity to do that. And and I think if I'm gonna do that, I have to create my own project in certainly in doc and and navigate it that way, but I I would be excited to to try that out. Editors um, make good directors. I, <laughs> yeah, I would think so. I, I I I could understand how it would be helpful having you know you look at um, wonderful filmmakers who've who've had all kinds of experiences in the field and mm. and then they turn into great directors whether they mm. were camera people or producers or right. um, because it all lends to the final outcome yeah. of the piece and you've worn different hats and then, um, but I imagine it's probably exciting to, to, and scary to, to be responsible for a vision that you have to see through and then take the heat or take the glory either way. Right. You know, it's yeah. a big responsibility. Um, right. yeah. But I, I would, I would love to try that. Sure. <laughs> Why not? One Why question not? that we Why always not? ask when we have our filmmaker guests <laughs> on the show is you, we always ask, what was the thing, what was the film or the movie or the the documentary, whatever? You, you said earlier that um, there, you know, the films that got you involved in wanting to work on documentaries. But is there something that got you, is there a film or a t television show or something that got you interested in film in general when you were young? The thing that was like, wow, I want to get do this. involved in that. Yeah. You know, I that's it. I always was um, fascinated by films and movies. Uh, growing up, it was just part of the texture of um, of our childhood and and growing up in terms of you know what did we watch? We watched like Laverne and Shirley, Little House on the Prairie, Happy Days. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, for me, for me, I feel like and that that's TV shows or whatever. But and and there are certainly films that struck me as being remarkable journeys. And I think what I love about a film is the power of story and sharing um, yeah. the, the experiences that we have as human beings for the time that we're here. And mm -hmm. uh, I've, I find that aspect of it super um, titillating to think about how, how to, there's such power in sharing story, you know? Yeah. And I feel like, um, I'm always trying to explore how we can get to know each other a little bit better or understand a different perspective or mm -hmm. empathize with the situation that's complicated that we can't experience ourselves or could never understand in a different way. And I, I think that's quite powerful. So I just want to be involved in, in, in bringing stories to life like that. It's you know? a great, it's a great calling. That's for yeah. sure. That's really it's cool. certainly, um, it's fun. Too, you know, I mean, it's fun to talk about it. Yeah. It's fun to work with students. I work with students um, sometimes at Columbia School of Journalism. And um, it's just, it's, it's truly amazing to be involved in um, this collaborative process and to navigate retelling or telling stories together. You know, it's, right. it's an exciting, exciting genre and what a gift that we have yeah. them to watch yeah. and and thank god that we do right yeah yeah totally i love that <laughs> i know thank god for stories now yeah. <laughs> well and this, and this was fun talking to you this was great and another very, story very yes <laughs> another thank great so story much. thank you so much for coming on with us for a little bit thank you thank really you for fun. having me this is it's great to see you guys and it's great to talk <laughs> shop Yep. I know. Yeah. So I never get tired of talking to filmmakers or talking about movies. Like it's just endlessly fascinating to me. Do you so guys have you guys. a film that was like your a film that inspired oh, us? Oh yeah, yeah, I have a lot. <laughs> yeah. What, what, was, what was one of your most memorable ones for that when you were younger that you think of? Well, I'm I the the work that I do has always been towards the sort of science fiction and design. I always liked. I always liked um, those old Ray Harryhausen movies. I remember seeing Jason and the Argonauts when I was a kid and just lo looking at the television. And I remember the feeling. I remember like, what the 
hell? You know, <laughs> it's like, how is that happening? Yeah. How is that happening? And it's magic. And it, and it was thrilling and exciting. And it told this story that I thought about for days and days. And I loved, I uh, always loved production design and the craft of, mm. of the design part of it. There were some British um, television shows that were all done with puppets in the 60s that when I was a little kid, I remember having the realization, wow, somebody built all that. Somebody made those models and vehicles and the little everything. And so I started building things. I started building miniatures and props and I did props for almost, you know, like a couple of decades and never got tired of it. I just got kind of where I couldn't keep up with it anymore and switched <laughs> right. over to the digital realm where I am now doing special <laughs> effects, but cool. mostly science fiction yeah. stuff. <laughs> I'd say, you know, I try and think of something cool, like back in my past. Oh, when I was watching Fellini and I was, uh, right. uh, but yeah. what I, I think uh, ultimately I think was sort of made me aware that it was, that it's actually a business and something that people were doing uh, was probably like dark shadows. <laughs> watching dark shadows oh, yeah. and they always had the problems with it where microphones would fall in yeah. or actor would forget their lines or you see someone in the background and i remember thinking someone's doing that hmm i really think that's like show business is kind of a job and well i didn't really go into the the actual making of films i ended up veering more toward you know what i could do which was art so i do like movie posters and yeah. you know, tv advertising but i was always drawn to that I think my biggest regret is not diving more into the actual making of, but I feel like my connection to it by advertising for them is sort of my sort of tangent to being sure. in films, but I would it's like to pursue more film. It's never too late. And I'm thinking about it after this. I think I want to try editing. <laughs> yeah, you should. I would love to, to talk with you about that. If you're serious, it's, I am serious. It's, it's a lot of fun working with sound and music and bringing mm -hmm something together rhythmically is a interesting ride. I love that idea. And, yeah. you know, I've just been you doing little tiny idea. things. When we started doing all this video, I've been kind of experimenting with how it works. I barely know the software, but I'm like, I think I could get into this. <laughs> I think I'm liking this. If you feel inclined, then I, I have to encourage you to do it. Um, I, I will it's do not it. for everyone. And, it's, and, and if you feel that sort of itching to learn about it, then I think... You're you're well on your way. Good advice. Excellent. There, that's I all I need here. Give you some here. pointers on the mechanics of the software and stuff. I yeah. can give you that, and then you Sorry. go to her to get the uh, f the the real <laughs> philosophy well, part of editing. The so. software is just the tool. That's yeah. Right. So so it, the it, the key is to figure out how to use the tool to create what you're looking yep. to do. Which and, is how you use Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, it becomes less daunting, you know, and it, yeah. Yeah. And I have a little bit of the, the knowledge of the basics of how it works because I do so much in Photoshop. I understand like the layerings and a lot of the effects and how it works and the color. So I get that. I just had to figure out how to apply it all to movement. Because <laughs> I use After Effects every day, which is an edit, kind of an editing yeah. thing, but it's, it's yeah. special effects. And it's I always call it um, when I when people ask me to show them things and to get into it, I always say it's if you know Photoshop, you're you're almost there. It's like Photoshop that moves. Mm -hmm. What do you use? That's right. After Effects is a really powerful tool too. I mean, it's so utilized and it's so yeah. important um, in film work, but it's, and it's magic. I, I love yeah. working with I love it. <laughs> I love After Effects. To, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing what you can achieve. And uh, I, 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 I don't think I could ever learn that tool or um nor is it up my alley necessarily but i i am i'm impressed constantly with these effects artists and what they're capable of yeah so are you final cut pro or Premier? no i'm avid now i used avid. To okay. final cut pro before they don't even get us edited. yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you know if you know you know <laughs> it, but uh but anyway avid is uh i know a lot of people are using premiere i i tend to use Avid and it's a lot of the projects that I work on um, use Avid as well. So to know which program to start using. So when I come to you, I can speak the language. So I'll yeah. Well, all, again, it's all <laughs> so they all work to do the same thing. Eventually right. it's just a matter of, and, and you can figure it out in, in each of them. So yeah. Premiere's more up your alley or easier in terms of having access to it. 
yeah. then what, don't let that be the hindrance, which tool, because it doesn't no. matter. It doesn't right. matter. I, I know I, Premiere, Premiere and easy because it's with Adobe, a creative suite, so I can get that for free. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I ever need to edit, I use Premiere and, and, yeah. um, after I edit right in After Effects a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I know it so well, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, now you've inspired us. A great way to end it because <laughs> it was a very Good. inspiring interview. Yes. I think. You were well, that's great. Safe. Thank you for um, talking with me about it. It's it's always exciting to share and uh, and learn. I didn't get to hear about Mark's favorite movie, but uh, oh right, yeah. oh, we got to talk to Mark about his well, inspiration. You know, for me growing up, I just love when I came out of a movie that really inspired me. I would just think about that movie all the way home and think about. I would love to be able to give this feeling I have to somebody else. So I, my, for me, it's writing. I've written many scripts. So that's oh, kind of my cool. thing. You know, I did a short movie a few years ago. So that's my thing, the st actually telling the story, writing it down, and hopefully someday making a movie where people come out and go, wow, that was, that's something I'm going to think about. That's my drive. Whoa. So, and there was a lot of that's movies cool. growing up that sort of gave that to me. But um, so that's, that's what I go for. That's my, my motivation. That's, that's a good thing to be going for. I'd love to, maybe I'll send you some script. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. <laughs> I, I love, re I love reading scripts. I love giving notes and I, I, I throw my scripts out to people and you know, I, I love, you know, getting ripped apart or say, Hey, that's nice. And so you love I do it. That really? all the time. <laughs> I know. Mark and I, Mark and I, I've written a bunch of stuff too. Mark and I have sent scripts back and forth to each other for years and it's, it's a, it's, that's where it all starts with the script, you know, if you're doing narrative and it's the thing that doesn't cost anything, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> yeah. that's what I like. I love the old, like older films that have low budgets, but they have these incredible stories by these great old pulp writers and stuff like film noir type stuff. And to me, it's like, here's, here's how you tell a story. You know, you, you can, if you write something with the intention of making a blockbuster that's got a million special effects or whatever, that's one thing. But if you can take your keyboard and create a compelling story that you can then shoot with your iPhone, that's, that's the challenge that everybody, I mean, it's like anyone, anyone can make a film now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that, and that's, there's a lot of things on that feel that way too yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is just getting to be on television why am i yeah. watching it i know it blows <laughs> me away blows me away the, the key is to get, yeah it, there's lots of things out there but uh, to try and make those things i think like mark said about that sort of make you feel a certain way right like yeah that's everything yeah. that's the that's power cool. of cinema that's storytelling and at least send writer. me your scripts i'd love to read them Awesome. That's right. <laughs> That'd be so cool. what you asked. <laughs> <laughs> bring them on. Bring it thank on. Thank you so much for being on. Now we got a lot of work to do since we've talked well, to you. <laughs> thank, thank you. And uh, thanks for chatting with me. And I feel like there's so much to unpack with editing. I'm happy to talk about it anytime in yeah. a variety awesome. of ways. There's really so much Love more. Love but, yeah. it. We'll have, we'll thank have you, you on for sure. All right. If you'll come back again. Off, but don't hang up. Okay. We're you, have to, end broadcast. Sure. you have to promise on the air that you will come back and join us again at some point in the future <laughs> so that we can use it to enforce that. No, I do not promise. <laughs> she didn't say it. She didn't say it. She didn't say it. You have That's to say, I will come back on the show again. I will come back on the show again anytime. <laughs> come on, Phil. <laughs> there you go. The contract has been made. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> we're going to. We're going to go out now. This is how we go out. We always <laughs> wave. Bye, Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.